so hello everybody welcome back so the first video about this uh, uh, topic it was interrupted I'm sorry about that one and I appreciate your understanding that you know sometimes my cell phone just drops so anyway <clears throat> So, before I continue, I wanted to remind you that down below is my email in case that you want to help me out by sending an Amazon gift card. So, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I have some books in Gumroad and I have a PayPal account also if you want to help me out. So, having said all that, um, let me remind you a few things. Um, or better yet, uh, I'm just going to make it uh, a little bit more clear. Um, the first group of people that left my country... Um, like I said, 0.5% of the population, maybe a little bit less, roughly, you know, it was, uh, the amount was big enough to, you know, uh, cut the attention for, for media and journalists and stuff like that. And it was documented in several, uh, you know, channels and TVs or whatever. But here's the deal. Those people um, that left, uh, they are the type of people that that uh, they believe that money served them. They believe that they are not slaves from uh, to money. So basically, those people uh, they just said, "I'm leaving," period, and then they took everything and left within three months. Okay, um, they did not plan the whole thing like everybody else. Uh, they were just kind of like. I'm not going to be here, and if I have to leave something because I can't sell or whatever, I will just leave someone else to take care of everything, and I'm not going to deal with headaches, and I'm not going to be a slave, so I'm leaving. You know, that kind of uh, thought process. Now, um, the second time when uh, people started leaving, it was, you know, the engineers and people from the oil industry and some teachers and, and, and some doctors. Uh, at this point, uh, these people actually got jobs and got everything in another countries and uh, they uh, took uh, some sort of planning, meaning they took, they, they did this with, uh, you know, just plan to get the documents and leave. That's it. You know, they didn't think about, you know, all the consequences or whatever. You know, they just needed to leave because... Now, uh, the government is hostile against them. The government is becoming hostile against uh, certain groups of, of, of entrepreneurs. If you are big enough, they will go against you. And the, the government went against, you know, um, teachers and doctors and whoever hold uh, a college degree kind of thing, okay? Uh, because basically... The idea was that you are not supposed to have money based upon your degree. You're supposed to have money based upon, you know, uh, the job per se. So if the job is pushing bottom, bottoms, you know, like operating machinery, then basically that's too easy. So basically you don't need to have an engineer for that and stuff like that. So again, this is going to influence wages. This is going to influence the cost of maintenance because if you have somebody that knows what the hell they are doing, they are not going to break the machinery. But if you don't have anyone that knows how the hell to, to operate the machinery and they don't know how to do maintenance and they don't know how to do these things, yeah, this is going to influence a hell of a lot later on because now basically uh, you have a, a whole lot of machinery and a whole lot of things that are, is broken. Because you have somebody that you pay them for pushing buttons. You didn't pay them for the knowledge of what buttons to push, when to push them, how to push them, and stuff like that. This also created problems with uh, the whole electrical system. Uh, at this point, uh, you know, they were also pushing buttons all over the place, not knowing what the hell they were doing. So one of the consequences of that was that uh, there is machinery. Uh, I'm not an engineer or something, but I'm going to try to resume this thing. There is a machinery that produces the aluminum things and the other ones that you need to have it working on 
literally, virtually, and physically 24 hours a day, every single day, forever. Because once the machinery stops, uh, the process uh, will break the machinery. So you will have to redo the machinery from a scratch. So basically, if you stop the machinery and the, the, the temperature drops half of a degree or something, then basically the machinery will break. This actually happened in the aluminum industry and it also happened in the uh, electrical industry because these people were just pressing buttons all over the place and they didn't care and these machinery were off. And it also almost cost the government um, everything because they were shutting down the electricity in Caracas like they didn't care and they didn't even know that they were shutting down the electricity in Caracas. And Tar Caracas is, is, is too big to handle and you're not supposed to, you know, mess around with those people. So basically, uh, at this point, the whole aluminum industry went to hell, literally. Because now you need to replace all of the machinery because someone had the great idea of stopping them and then start trying to restart it. You can't restart certain machinery. Once you stop them, you throw them out. That's it. So this thing costed uh, the industries billions of dollars for one moment. And uh, this is going to influence a hyperinflation in terms of production and in terms of electricity. Because if you don't have electricity and now you need to replace all the machinery and now you, don't, you do not have people that are able to do this properly, then it, it, you, need per, you need people that will, will be able to fix this problem. And if you don't have them locally, you need to import them. And nobody wants to come here because nobody wants to deal with the government. And so they brought Russian people, Cuban people, and even Chinese people to try to fix this problem. And everybody told the same thing. The machinery is broken. You need to replace it, period. You, you can't, you know, there are things that you just can't uh, repair. There are things that once they're broken, they're broken. You need to replace them. And replacing the, the, the whole industry in that state, uh, it was going to cost virtually all of the money that uh, we were making. All of it. And of course, you know, the government said no. So, <laughs> so this influenced it a hell of a lot because uh, pipes were also starting to break because these people were uh, putting too much water pressure into the pipes. So pipes started blowing up and some of them they were being deviated. I do not know how the hell they do that, whatever, but it was insane. So basically, they, they literally destroyed everything. And for some sort of miracle, uh, the, 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 the system was so, so freaking well designed that the people that designed these systems were from the US and Germany. And they were also Japanese. And they were also uh, very, very, very thoughtful Venezuelans. So this system was designed to, uh, for example, our electrical system was designed to survive a freaking zombie apocalypse. I'm not joking. That thing, it, you, you can't hack it, you can't destroy it, uh, unless you actually physically bombed it, like put a bomb in there, then that thing is, is meant to run against zombies and against Godzilla, for all I know. But it's working at, you know, probably around, you know, somewhat of half capacity, not even the full capacity or whatsoever. So this is going to create a hell of a lot of uh, shortages in electricity, shortages in materials, shortages in gasoline, shortages in pipes, shortages in water, shortages in this and that and this and that and anytime every time that you have the word shortage that means more and more and more and more and more and then even more money so at this point um 
the government did not have a choice, but they they took down five. Uh, they took down six zeros out of the out of the currency. So they took down three zeros, and then they took down uh, five zeros more, and then they were kind of like insane, because the amount of money that you had to have in Bolivares to try to buy one dollar, it was literally millions, like millions. Right now, if you if we were having the same currency, the same name and the same number that we have in 1999, we will need. Uh, roughly uh, about uh, 30 billion 30 billion bolivares to buy one dollar hell for all i know we will need more just one dollar so the hyperinflation uh, affected everything and the reason was that uh, people started thinking that college degrees are useless and most people agree with that. And people that had the actual degrees left because they were feeling hostile. So what happened is that um, in 2003, uh, you know, in 2001, 2003, most people started actually leaving because in 2001, people started planning for leaving. People that didn't leave because, you know, if you have a, a college degree on, on, on uh, engineering and you are very, very specialized and you have a hell of a lot of experience in handling disasters and stuff like that, and you go abroad, you get a job immediately. Hell, for all I know, you can ask $10,000 for a started job position. So, oh crap, you know, these people just left. And uh, a hell of a lot of people started feeling hostile, hostile uh, treatment towards them. And that included uh, teachers and doctors. And at this point, uh, they also started thinking about leaving. And the ones that decided to stay, uh, they started fortifying their houses. So at this point, you will see that most people are now having uh, fences, walls, and electrical wiring all over their houses. And if you can afford it, you do that. Other people started buying security cameras and stuff like that. And as soon as people realized that there were problems with water, um, they also started building water tanks inside their houses, uh, if you could afford it. Because like I said, this happened at the same time that people now that don't have any kind of money because it's between 2001 and 2003. So, 2003, people started, you know, realizing that uh, there is no more money for food or whatever. So they are asking governments for help. The government is helping by pressuring the people that stole the money to buy the food for um, for 10, uh, 10, you know, out of 100 and whatever. And so ch food was becoming available, very cheap, uh, imported, not produced locally. Because now the local industries are facing problems with water, problems with electricity, problems with uh, people that do not want to work. Because obviously, if you are making $1,000, but you are spending $800 in transportation, then what the hell are you doing? Most people didn't want to work at all. So it's like the people started feeling that they were sort of like being abused and being slave. And they did not blame the government, but they, they blamed the employees the employers, actually, the employers. So at this point, a hell of a lot of things started to happen. Like people became, became angry and there were a lot of riots and there were a, a lot of students that wanted to take the government out, but they couldn't. And then um, at this point, uh, government gave guns to um, militias that were for them. And they also gave guns to uh, prisoners. And they also, uh, you know, gave guns to uh, guerrillas and stuff like that. And they did it because uh, they said that the reason why people were in jail is because they didn't get the choice of studying. So now uh, they are telling everybody that they have to study but they, then they, they are supposed to do it by taking a freaking course. And once you pass the freaking course, 
uh, that doesn't even have, you know, proper testing or whatever, basically you got degrees. And now people feel very important because you have a degree, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make any kind of sense. And, um, sorry, my daughter is very excited because, you know, we are now having a power outage and she was reading a lot, so she finished the book. And, you know, it's good because at least she has something to do while we have no power. So anyway, <clears throat> so like I was saying, um, at this point when they reduced the three zeros of the, the currency and cash became scarce and the government decided not to pay anything abroad either, because they were kind of like, you should be uh, grateful that we are there. And, you know, everybody else in the, in, in, the, in the other countries were like, what? You're supposed to pay rent here or whatever. And it was insane. So the whole national uh, and international things were collapsing because of money. And when that happened, um, the government was almost out. But then they screw up the legal process. And when they screw up the legal process, uh, that was it. The government was able to come back because of legal technicality, technicalities. And then they started doing all over the same process of uh, saying that they were going to uh, invest money to repair the things that they destroyed. And they started a hell of a lot of jobs, but they never finished not even 10% of whatever the hell they started. So they never, they never finished any job. And again, they were hiring people to build bridges. And, you know, with the degrees that now they supposedly have and they're supposed to be, you know, know how to help to build bridges or whatever. And they are building the bridges. And as soon as it rains or as soon as it gets like a, a small storm or something, the bridges are collapsing, literally. They are just destroyed. So basically, it, you are losing materials, you are losing time, you are losing uh, resources. And at this point, most engineers and most uh, teachers are actually leaving the country because they are kind of like, you are a joke. And um, this is creating even more pressure on the money. Because when you have people that are leaving your country, they are taking your money and exchanging it into another country. And basically, uh, nobody can take bolivares to, for example, the US. You need US dollars. So a lot of people are bu buying more and more and more and more US dollars because everybody wants to leave. And so this affects the, the supply and demand of bolivares. So... There is a hell of a lot of problems with cash. There is a hell of a lot of problems getting US dollars. And there is a hell of a lot of problems uh, with the whole system that is collapsing because there is nobody that is able to support it. And the reason is because the government went against the engineers and against the doctors and against the teachers. Because, you know, that's the whole point. You can press a button, then you can do the job. Oh, hell no. But, you know, uh, this thing costed the whole industry and the whole industry was destroyed. Uh, the gasoline industry was destroyed and everything was destroyed. They brought uh, people from abroad trying to fix the problems, but they can't because nobody understands uh, Venezuelan things. So let me explain this. Our... Um, Physics here works the same as in the other in the other parts of the planet, but it's kind of like you going to Japan and realizing that everything is like in a whole new level. Yeah, in my country, everything is in a whole new level because everything in my country is built to last, like I said, zombie apocalypse. It's not disposable. It's something that uh, we create things that will last, uh, you know, they, for all I know, like I said, it can withstand Godzilla. And the reason for this is because we are in Jumanji. We never know what the hell can happen in this country. We have a place, for example, uh, in, in the Sulia state that has 
Literally, if, if somebody says there is no white lightning can hit the same spot twice, yeah, say that to that, pra say that, to that place, you know? It, it gets like 400 lightning every single day, whether there is a storm or not. And uh, it, uh, yeah, it is bad. So, and then you go to, to other places in, in like, like Bolivar, like I told you, and there is water there that produces energy that is 5,000 compared to the other energy that is 40. And it is, it is kind of like that. So my country is literally Jumanji. I'm not freaking joking. It's Jumanji. You don't know what the hell. So you need to build things in my country that can withstand a freaking zombie apocalypse. Because otherwise, they will just be destroyed within one or two weeks. I'm not joking. So, you know, Venezuelans know this. So they, you know, the engineers and all, everybody else, they figure that they needed to do these things so that it will, will last that. Otherwise, they were not going to do it. So... If you have somebody from Japan that comes here, they will tell you, how the hell can that thing be working? And quite frankly, even the engineers, if you tell them all of the things that are happening, uh, you know, it, when you have, for example, people from Venezuela doing an exposition in Korea or, or uh, South Korea about the water situation in my country, it's specifically in my city, they have to ask for an official translator from the embassy and everything because they don't get it. They are kind of like, what? Why will you put the water going through there to do what? What? How is it that everybody is alive? You know, you know how is it that you haven't turned into zombies yet because of this water? Yeah, kind of like that. So it's like nobody, and I do mean nobody, nobody that has a right mind will be able to understand my country. We have two presidents. We have the, the resources that are insane, literally insane. We have, uh, we, just, we just discovered that we have two elements in the, for the periodic table that they are not there and they are only in my country. And for all I know, I swear to God, I believe that we are above, uh, you know, we, we, we have alien spaceships uh, built on the ground of our, our country. It is just insane. It, 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 yeah, Jumanji. It, it, when, they were, when they created the world, the world of Jumanji and the game that you can possibly do anything and nothing and, and you don't know what the hell. Yeah, you, could, you should have thought about Venezuela. I swear to God, I think that when, when God created this this uh this particular country god says oh yeah i'm giving you you know that and i'm giving you yeah you know what i'm going to give you two more elements other than the periodic table so that you can get it oh and i'm giving you the best water and by the way but oh yeah but i'm denying you a volcano because i think that giving you a volcano will be too much other than giving you you know the very strong mountains and, and giving you all year round i mean literally you can go in a country if you drive Five hours, you can be in a place that is snowing. And five hours you drive and you can be in the hottest desert. That is how insane my country is. So, oh, hell no. So, <clears throat> this is going to influence a hell of a lot in, in, in our situation and the reason why we are experiencing hyperinflation for so long time. Most countries, if they experience hyperinflation, within three to six months, no more than a year, that government will be completely destroyed by the people. And, and I do mean that. There is no way the other people will be able to withstand what Venezuelans can because we are in freaking humanity. We are completely different from every other you know, for all I know, I have been told by at least, you know, 400 people that uh, Venezuelan's case for hyperinflation and things like that is a unique case. It is a case study for history, for global history. And it's just insane. And the reason is that. So our hyperinflation is, is different than uh, other people. The German hyperinflation, when they, when they went through hyperinflation, it was because of the war and because they were printing money like crazy. And they knew that. 
uh, when Zimbabwe went through hyperinflation, it's kind of like the same, except for the fact that they were backed up by a hell of a lot of resources that that country has. My country, yeah, we are going through hyperinflation because basically we destroy our own people. Uh, we went, you know, crazy with all of the resources that we have. Then we decided that we didn't want one government, but two. We decided, oh, hell no, it, it's just Jumanji. So... The whole process of, of, of a normal process, a normal, and I do mean like history not being Venezuela, will be like you have inflation and then uh, every time that you have inflation, this inflation, by the way, is usually, usually 70% chance the inflation you are, you are experiencing is uh, uh, artificial. Artificially, I mean that um, somebody is lying about the shortage. And when people say and hear the word shortage, in their minds, they go crazy. Because in their minds, they go kind of like, okay, if I don't have that, uh, I'm going to buy it. And then your emotion, when, when you have shortages, is I'm going to run and get it. Even if you don't need it. So if somebody says, yeah, there is a shortage of toilet paper. And then you're like, yeah, I have toilet paper for six months. But... Just in case, I'm going to buy more. And then, you know, logically speaking, you're kind of like, why would you buy more if you have for six months? It's an emotional thing. And the emotional thing will drive you crazy, will drive you to paranoia. And when you're doing paranoia, uh, and when you're experiencing paranoia, like I've been telling you in several videos, you will go and do rookie mistakes like if you were a five-year-old doing a tantrum. It's just insane. So um, the shortages that probably you are having, they are very, very, very likely artificially. They are being created on purpose. They are not natural. If they were natural, um, inflation natural, uh, it can last maybe two or three months. Natural. You know, and I'm talking about, you know, all of the books that I have uh, read about, you know, economies and things like that. And it will be kind of like this. Um, let's say that uh, you were producing mangoes and all of a sudden there is a drought. And so this year, instead of collecting 100,000 mangoes, you collected 50,000 because there was a drought. So you have a short inflation period because there was a drought. So you have natural causes. Uh, but next year, mangoes are going to be okay. Because next year, hopefully, you are not going to experience a drought. So next year, if you are okay and you're not, you, you, know, you don't have the drought, then mangoes will be normal. And now you have 100,000, which is the normal. And then, you know, you will be okay. So naturally, it should last maybe, you know, two or three months, but no more. But the ones that are artificial, they are uh, created by playing in your emotions and by advertising uh, the word shortage in your head and as soon as by the way as soon as you as a person get used to the idea that shortages are okay and that you can handle it and whatever and your tolerance level goes up because now you're not panicking but rather you're you're, you're just kind of like yeah i'm just going to buy more or whatever you are you're adapting to shortages as soon as you do that then the shortage will go in, they, it will be like a fork. It will be one and then four. And then each side of the fork will divide itself into four more or two more. And then you will have uh, shortages everywhere. And when that happens, you will experience a hell of a lot of hyperinflation. Now, if you are in a country that is normal, meaning that the people have power and everything like that, Hyperinflation will not last more than six months because I can assure you that um, someone head, someone's head is going to go down and be cut off from the government because somebody has to take the blame. And if you don't blame, you know, the, the entrepreneurs and people actually believe that the, that the responsible of all of these problems is the government, then yeah, oh hell. That, that means two things. That can end up, you know, in a political civil war, not necessarily a civil war, you know, between people, but political things like left versus right and stuff like that. 
And then, you know, it can create certain tensions between people, but it, it wouldn't arise to, to the point of civil war. Um, and then it will go differently. Because at this point, somebody has to take the road and, and stop it. Because otherwise, you are going to probably be in a, in a position that is going to be completely different than my country. The reason is because, like I said, my country is Jumanji. No other country in the planet is Jumanji. And I do mean that. I have been in several countries and I can tell you right now that no other country in the planet will be Jumanji. Except mine. So it's like you saying that the rest of the world is like Japan. Oh, hell no. There is Japan. There is other places. And yeah, and mine is like, there is Venezuela, meaning Jumanji, and then there are other places, you know. So uh, each country has its uniqueness. So, for example, if you want to have something, uh, you know, uh, that is reliable, very well done and stuff like that, you call people from Germany. If you, if you want to have, you know, something that is uh, business, reliable and, and stuff like that and honesty or whatever, you call somebody from the US or Japan or something like that. But if you want something that is completely nuts and the probability of, of failing is, you know, 99 to 1 and then you want it to be, you want it to make that shot work, then you got to call a Venezuelan because that is the only, <laughs> that will probably be the only way for that for you to make it work. Now, uh, I'm talking about all of these things because uh, people are asking how does it work or whatever. And the thing is that it has been working from hyperinflation in my country and it's even bigger and it's not going to probably stop anytime soon, probably this year, um, hopefully by December this year. Uh, because, you know, we have had several things that we have been going through to stop it. And um, I do not know, you know, how is it that uh, we are still alive in my country. But like I said, it's because we are Jumanji. And it's also because a hell of a lot of people from Venezuela left the country and they are sending money to survive here. I, I will not be here if it wasn't for the help from uh, my family abroad. And lately, like I said, you know, in, in the other videos, I have been getting um, help from other uh, foreigners that are helping me out. And that's how I'm able to make it. Because at this point, you know, uh, if you are going through hyperinflation uh, and then you're wondering what will work against your currency, for example, for the US, I can assure you right now, I do not think... And again, I'm not a financial advisor or anything like that, but I have said it before. I do not think that you're going to be able to make it through gold or, or, or silver. And the reason is simple. When you're trading, uh, you need something universal. You need something that is not going to be easily counterfeited. Because if, if you have a piece of metal that it is uh, silver in color, and then you tell people that this is silver and this is not silver, but it is just as metal, scrap metal, like, like uh, iron. And people can't tell the difference between iron and silver. Then basically you have a problem because people are going to realize that this isn't working. And it's going to create a hell of a lot of problems. You need something that is universal, meaning that every single person, even a kid who is five years old, will be able to handle and understand. That means it needs to be salt, coffee, sugar, um, I don't know, something that you can trade easily and something that you can trade with a five-year-old and that five-year-old can understand what the hell you're doing because that's how it works. You can't trade gold with everybody because gold is something that not everyone will have. How many people do you know that they have right now, you know, in, in gold coins to trade with you? Probably, you know, one in every what? 200, 400 people? 
Now, if you were to tell me that every single person in the U.S. have, you know, uh, silver coins, then that might be the way to go. But in terms of trading um, and in terms of uh, what will people use against the U.S. dollar, I'm thinking that they are probably going to use euros or uh, they are probably going to use, like I said, other uh, currencies that are stable and they are for trading. Uh, when we didn't have cash in, in, in certain places in my country, I have mentioned this in the other videos, there are places in my country in which uh, everyone has access to gold. Literally every single person in that town. It's like you walk, you dig a hole, and now you have gold. So everybody is trading gold in there. But, you know, that's because everybody knows gold and everybody has access to gold. Now, are they trading it in the right price or whatever? Oh, hell no. Nobody cares. It's like, yeah, I just want a, a little, you know, give me a stone. We call it a stone. It's kind of like a little piece, you know, it's kind of like one gram or something of gold. So people there go like, yeah, give me one stone. And they don't even care if the gold is more or less or whatever. They just trade it. And that's it, you know, they kind of like, yeah, this is too much or this is too little and they will know what the hell. But if you take that into, for example, my city, oh, hell no, you have 99% of people that will not know what the hell. They will think it's, it's just metal that you painted with yellow. So you know what I mean? So, but there is another place in my country that when, when we have this problem that, like I said before, um, they were trading there in coffee, pure coffee. And there was two ways of doing it, by grain or, uh, you know, uh, already roasted and, and powder. So if you wanted to get anything done or, or, or trade or something, uh, people will say, I want, you know, this amount of coffee. And that's it. That's how people do transactions in that place. Because every single person knows about coffee and there are people that are producing coffee and there are people that, you know, this is usable and this is something that a five-year-old can understand because it's something that you are used to. This is the reason why it's something, it, we have something called salary. Salary comes from the word salt. It's because, you know, when, 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 when the Romans were traveling everywhere, they didn't know what the hell to trade because, like I said, what the hell are you going to trade if people don't know what the difference between gold and, and you painting metal with yellow is? People will feel, you know, that you can counterfeit that thing or whatever. You, you will have a hundred, a hundred troubles that I can mention uh, with gold and silver or metals or whatever because you, you what the hell? You can't do that to a five-year-old. So, however, at that time, the Romans realized that, oh, hell, we have salt. Salt is something that people use, you know, for, uh, for cooking. You use it for uh, saving food. You use it for uh, presents. You use it for, uh, you know, good luck and cleaning and a hell of a lot of things. So we're using salt. And that's what you're trading. Salt. You didn't even, uh, if, you, if you had coins and, and, and metals, you trade it against salt. So if the U.S. needed to, you know, come up with some sort of arrangement, I will look at what does my particular region produces and stuff that we can actually use as trading. In, in Mexico, in the, in the ancient times, uh, they didn't have coins, but they traded in cocoa beans. That was their currency, cocoa beans. In fact, if you were caught stealing somebody else's, you know, cocoa beans or something, oh hell, you could have been killed. Because you're not supposed to touch money that doesn't belong to you. And money in that time, it was, uh, you know, appreciated like the cocoa beans. So if the US dollar loses value, then you need to figure out what does hold value in the place that you're in. Because it's not the same living in California than living in Florida or living in New York. It's not the same. The climate is not the same. The people are not the same. The knowledge level of people is not the same. So you got to figure out that one on your own.
And most likely, like I said, you will be trading against the euro because uh, most people will, will rather live towards Europe. If you're living in your country, if you're living in the U.S., is most Americans need to leave the U.S., where do you think they're going? To Europe? Or do you think that they're going to Africa? Or do you think that they will be going uh, towards, you know, Asia? The most logical choice will be that most people are going to go to Europe. And if you're going to go to Europe, then obviously you are going to trade in euros. So this is, you know, the best logical choice. The choice for Venezuela and Bolivar is, was US dollars because most people will rather go to the US than go to, you know, other Latin country. However, if we were to choose, you know, most Venezuelans were like, oh no, well no, we are all going to Colombia. Oh hell, then we'll all be trading not in US dollars, but in Colombian pesos. See what I mean? Because it will be what general people, like everyone, and I'm talking five-year-olds, okay? Five-year-olds will get it. If you can't make a five-year-old get it, then you're probably not going to be able to do it. Because most people, you have to assume that they have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Because like I said, uh, if, if you have metal that looks like silver and you tell them, yeah, this is silver. Yeah, I don't know. Or I can't take that because I'm not going to eat it. I don't know what the hell to do with that. See what I mean? So... The inflation and hyperinflation will destroy currencies, but it will not destroy uh, the trading system per se. And you need to understand the trading system per se that you used to have before the inflation problems. For that, you might need to look into your uh, ancestors or um, I don't know. Because like I said, it will depend upon where you are. And it will also depend upon what you think people will do from your country. If all of your people in your country, all of your fellow people are living towards Asia, uh, towards, let's say that they, everybody's living towards Japan, then very likely a hell of a lot of people will be trading in Japanese gens because everybody wants to live towards Japan. Now, if you're thinking cryptocurrency, whatever, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Because that one depends upon electricity. You're not going to have. Uh, that one is going to be unreliable, unstable, whatever. Uh, that one is also going to depend upon internet. Yeah, again, that one is going to be unstable, unreliable, whatever. You're not going to have access to 24 hours a day to the internet. So are you going to trade in that? I don't know. It will depend upon, like I said, you. What do you think people will do? You know your local people more than anyone. Or at least you should know. Hell, I know Venezuelans, general. You know, I can't know Chinese people. I don't know what the hell is their culture because I don't live in China. I live in Venezuela. So wherever the hell you live, I'm guessing that you already kind of know what people will do. And by the way, this is not a guessing game. You have to actually ask people because what you will do is not the same what other people will do. So you have to try to follow uh, everyone's path kind of thing, generally speaking, you know. So I hope that this was helpful, so thank you for watching.